there might go to four or five, right? It all depends on the, the engineering conditions. So we pour the footing, we have a nice grade beam, but now we're gonna pour a concrete or cast a concrete stem wall on top of this. Well, that's a cold joint, right? The stem wall on top of the concrete wall is what we would term a cold joint, meaning that they don't get cast together. They get cast separately, so there's no bonding action. It's total gravity. So the way to battle any slippage across that cold joint is to introduce these J-bars, right? So you can see these they have laid down. So my assumption is they're going to pour concrete and then they're just going to rotate these up and stand them up like that. And then these will be inside that cast wall and somewhere in here will have that top of footing. So that J-bar will then be what bridges that cold joint to give that shear action across that cold joint. Now, just like we talked about in corners, you notice these are J-bars, they go down and they go in, I don't know, it looks like they go in about 10 inches or so here, right? They don't just go down into the ground. You see some guys, they'll just stick these in after the footing, but you gotta remember, concrete transferring the load to steel it needs a certain developmental length to get that composite action. So we actually turn the bar as a J to develop that required distance for those J bars. And it looks like these are, I don't know, these might be about 24 inches on center here. And it looks like they come up about two feet into the wall. But notice here, there's a couple taller ones, right? So. These are a little taller. You can see them standing up much higher than the other ones. Now, the reason again is, remember, this footing's at a double height because it has the garage portal. So because there's a lot of stresses that are going down that really slim wall connecting to the concrete wall here, we have to develop enough strength to receive those forces in the portal frame, right? When you think of a garage, garage wall, you have a 14 foot wall. If I had to divide 1400 pounds, and I don't know what the load is, I'm using easy math here, right? What that suggests is that I have 100 pounds per foot. But now, if I take that and I put a 10 foot garage door in and I have a 10 foot wall or two foot wall here and a two foot wall there, that thousand pounds that was where the door is, 500 of it goes into here and 500 of it goes into there. So that first two feet is not at 100 pounds shear load, it's at 350 pounds of shear load in that, in that first foot. So that's why these get taller and we have to develop a little bit more strength there. So let's take a walk. We're gonna walk over here. We'll talk about one of the footings and uh, we can wrap this up. So. You can see we have a, a bunch of footings that go inside the foundation here. But over here, we have a nice big spread footing. And the reason it's called a spread footing, you guessed it, you can see here, the footing comes and it spreads out, right? Comes in at 16 inches and it looks like it goes to 24 for probably about, I don't know, that's probably close to four feet long. Now, the interesting thing about footings like this is, I haven't seen the plans, but I would almost guarantee this means that there's a point load coming down, right? There's a column that's carrying roof loads, girder trusses, beams from the second floor, all of that, and it's coming down onto this grid of reinforcing here. Now, what we're talking about there is, <clears throat> gotta untie my, Adobe block so I can get this, all right? I've talked about this before, but think of it as if I have a piece of paper and I stick a pencil on it, if the pencil has a sharp leaded point and I put it there, it goes right through, right? If I spin the pencil around and I put the eraser part against it, it crushes the paper, but it doesn't really puncture unless I really add some force to it, and then I will slowly push it down. Now, if I wanted to stop the eraser side of the pencil, 
then what I would do is make the paper a lot thicker, right? If I took one inch stack of paper and now tried to push the eraser through, I probably wouldn't be able to, I'm sure, right? I probably wouldn't be able to put the leaded point through. My point there is, let's get to the point, because the point has everything to do with it. It's called puncture shear, right? So the footing here is trying to resist this load that's coming down, trying to pierce through the footing. So in able to react to that, we put the reinforcing cage down at the bottom. It stiffens that footing. So as I imply this load here, that footing can then resist and push back. And this column load can't puncture down through that system. As well as, you know, when that column comes down over here, I don't know, this wall might be seeing, let's say 800 pounds per linear foot of house above it, right? If I get over here, that one column in six square inches could be seeing 12,000 pounds of load coming down into it, right? So we have to build the footing. And you know, there's another footing to my right there that's maybe a little bit larger than half the size, my assumption is, is that column is probably doing about 30 or 40% less work than this column is just by given the size, right? Because that whole puncture shear is all about how many layers of paper do I put underneath the pencil so that I can resist the implied load above it, right? So, and you can see here, it's a heavier cage of rebar. Not only do we have the two bars that run through the wall, but we've added two to the outside here. We've added one to the outside and we did an opposing direction here. So what's happening there is not only is that footing working in conjunction with the whole run of footing in bending this way, it's also taking care of bending this way, right? So that's what I would call a two-way slab. It's resisting the tensile forces in both directions, as opposed to here, this is just a concrete beam resisting them in one direction, right? So, um, yeah, great work. I mean, it's all tied nicely. And again, you know, some of those stand-up bars, I like this, they'll just come in after they pour the concrete, they'll stand those up and then we'll cast that wall on top of it. And they have a really, uh, really great system going here. So um, I don't think there's anything more to talk about reinforcing. You've, you've successfully got a whole semester of my concrete engineering class in about nine minutes. So good for you. Um, if you wanna find out more, you know, you can find me, I'm on Instagram, I'm on LinkedIn, I'm on Facebook, I'm even on TikTok, although I, I abandon that um, as a last resort usually and, until I can find some time to go and rehash it. But uh, very active on Instagram, but so are my friends, Brian from Pioneer Builders, Tim from Awesome Framers. Tim, if you're in the industry and you wanna talk about framing, He's got some of the best framing videos out there. I know Brian is developing his YouTube channel too. Go check those guys out. They do really great work. It is a meticulous and very conscious effort by both of those guys in trying to understand not only what we do and why we do it, but to what extent we do it and when is good enough, good enough, right? We don't need to be building footings like furniture. We need to build them to do a certain job, which means that we can stop at a certain level of, um, you know, precision, right? So anyways, go check those guys out. I'm signing off. Steve Basic Architect. Long live our buildings.